You know, it's just been a month since um, the choir has returned as the regular presence in our worship service, and isn't it great to have the choir back? Thank you, choir. Thank you, Linda. So some of you know that I have just returned from several weeks leading a group of church folks on a walking pilgrimage along the Camino de Santiago. The Camino is one of the world's great ancient pilgrimage routes, beginning in France and stretching some 700 kilometers to the northwest coast of Spain. And every year, tens of thousands of pilgrims from many lands and many faiths, or, or no faith, walk all or a portion of the Camino just as pilgrims have for centuries before. And one of the great gifts of, of walking on the Camino is all of the people that you meet along the way. Not just the folks in your own little group, but you know other pilgrims that you pass on the trail or, or rest with for lunch or have a conversation with over dinner. And it doesn't take long for these conversations to come around to the question of why. Why are you walking? What compelled you to undertake this long, sometimes arduous journey in the first place? And it turns out that some folks are struggling with loss, and the pilgrimage is a way for them to grieve. And others are facing a major life transition and are hoping to have some new way forward revealed to them. And still others are, are seeking something. They're seeking some insight, some spiritual awakening. But I'll tell you what. Scratch the surface of just about any pilgrim's story. And before long, you'll bump up against the problem of forgiveness. It seems to me that just about everyone on the Camino is struggling to forgive someone or something. A parent, an ex, God, fate, or hardest of all sometimes, themselves. And I think what's true on the Camino is probably true for all of us as well. We too are pilgrims making our way along life's journey and if we're honest with ourselves, many of us struggle or have struggled with forgiveness. I know I have. Walking the Camino has helped me change the way I think about forgiveness. It's helped me to understand forgiveness itself as a kind of pilgrimage or journey, sometimes along a difficult one. And this morning, I'd just like to share a few thoughts about how we might make this, this pilgrimage of forgiveness in ways that help us experience healing and wholeness and reconciliation in our own lives. Just like with any journey, oftentimes the most important and difficult step on the path of forgiveness is the first one, is just getting started. Which is why I thought I'd share with you this morning a prayer that came across my desk not, long, not too long ago. It's a, it's a prayer wit written by the late and beloved South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter, the Reverend Mpho Tutu. And the prayer's suggestive title immediately caught my attention because they call it the prayer before the prayer of forgiveness. <laughs> and it goes like this. Dear God, I want to be willing to forgive, but I dare not ask for the will to forgive in case you give it to me and I am not yet ready. <laughs> Amen. I am not yet ready for my heart to soften. 
I am not yet ready to be vulnerable again. Not yet ready to see that there is humanity in my tormentor's eyes. Or that the one who hurt me may also have cried. I am at the prayer before the prayer of forgiveness. I'm not yet ready for the journey. Not yet interested in the path. Grant me the will to, for, to want to forgive. Grant it to me, not yet. But soon. Now, I just think that's some honest talk right there, <laughs> right? The best prayers are always the most honest ones. And I wonder if you've ever found yourself uttering a prayer like this, a prayer that expresses our desire to forgive, our good intention to forgive, but that also confesses, honestly, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> we're thinking about it. We're getting close. We're not yet ready to forgive. It's the prayer before the prayer of forgiveness. And I just want to pause for a moment and honor that this prayer is itself an important first step on the journey of forgiveness. For it's an expression of our desire and intention. Yes, we want to forgive. We really do. We know it's the right thing to do. We don't want to be buried, burdened by all the resentment we're holding, carrying around those grudges like those people in the children's story this morning, right? We want to be free of it, if only for our own health and wholeness. We want to forgive, but maybe not just yet. It's the prayer before the prayer of forgiveness. Now, when you consider the context out of which this particular prayer arose, written by Archbishop Tutu in post-apartheid South Africa, then it's even more remarkable, isn't it, that in the wake of that violence, in the violence of apartheid, to declare oneself open to even the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation is itself a considerable spiritual achievement. And I wonder if there is on your heart this morning an unexpressed desire or intention for forgiveness. If so, then articulating that intention can be an important first step on the journey. Another important step on the journey is to name the hurt that exists. Name the harm. Either the harm that another has done to you, or if it's yourself that needs forgiving, the harm that you feel you've caused. Name it. This might seem obvious, but I'll tell you what, one way you can be sure that you'll never forgive someone is if you don't ever consciously acknowledge to yourself that they hurt you. <laughs> and it's easy to be in denial when others hurt us, especially those who are closest to us and whom we love the most. I think we've all experienced how we can go around pretending that we don't have a problem with someone, pretending we weren't hurt, while all the while harboring this semi-conscious resentment toward them that shows up in all of these passive-aggressive ways. Sometimes a friend will ask me, you know, hey, Rob, are we, are we good? Is it, are we okay? You know, and you know, I'll say, oh yeah, we're good. It's, it's all good. But it's not all good. You know, when is it ever all good, right? Being in denial about the harm, or even unspecific about the harm, can be a roadblock on the path to forgiveness. So acknowledge the hurt. You know, and then once we've named the harm, well, then we've got to tend to it. Here's the thing. It's hard for us to forgive others when our wounds are still open 
and raw, right? You know, we preachers have a saying that goes, preach from your scars, not from your wounds. See, preachers use their own experiences of struggle and sorrow to minister to others from the pulpit. But if we preach from these experiences while our wounds are still raw, then our sermons can be, you know, nothing, end up being some kind of form of self-therapy rather than the ministry to others. So we say preach from our scars, not from our wounds. And I think the same is true of forgiveness. I think we forgive from our scars and and not from our wounds. If you want to forgive, first tend to the harm that was, that was done to you. Take care of yourself. Be good to yourself. Heal that wound. I was reminded of this lesson recently while listening to uh, a TED talk given by the Sikh, the Sikh civil rights activist Valerie Kaur. I don't know if some of you might know about Valerie. She, she tells a terrible story of how her uncle was, was murdered in what turned out to be the first documented hate crime in the wake of September 11, 2001, the, the terror attacks. Carr's uncle, Balbir Singh Sodi, owned a gas station in Mesa, Arizona. And he was planting flowers outside his station when a man named Frank Roque drove by and killed him. And it was later revealed that the night before, the night after 9-11, Mr. Roque had been heard threatening to take revenge on Muslims. He'd mistaken Mr. Singh for a Muslim. In 2015, 14 years after her uncle's murder, Kaur and her family did a remarkable thing. They called Frank Roque, who was serving a life sentence in prison, and they offered him their forgiveness. And at first he appeared to rebuff this gracious gesture, but as the conversation continued, both sides warmed up, and at the end of the conversation, Roque said, I, I want you to know from my heart that I'm sorry for what I did. And one day when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your uncle and I will ask him for his forgiveness. In her TED talk, Valerie Kaur points out it took them 14 years to get to the place where they could forgive their uncle's murderer. And during that time, they tended to the harm that had been done. They cared for the family. They'd started up organizations that helped protect the civil rights of Muslims and Sikhs to prevent future hate crimes. They tended to the harm, and then they were ready to forgive. And so I'd asked us to consider this morning, are there some wounds that we need to tend to before we can move to the important work of forgiveness? So declaring our intention to forgive, naming the hurt, tending to the wound, and then I just add one more step that I think we can take as we, as we move forward on this journey toward forgiveness. And that is to remember. You know, way back, someone once said something that got us all off on the wrong foot. They said, to forgive is to forget. <laughs> right? Nah. Yeah, that's right. That doesn't really work for us. In fact, the opposite is true. To forgive is not to forget, it's to remember, and it's to engage in a particular kind of remembering. You know, one of the lessons that Archbishop Tutu learned from South Africa's truth and reconciliation process was that when people told their story of harm under apartheid and oppression, when they remembered out loud, it eased their suffering and helped them to forgive, right? 
But I think there's another even deeper level of remembering that is required for forgiveness. In order to forgive, we need to remember something about our common human condition. We need to remember something about the imperfection and frailty of the human condition. A wise but anonymous poet once wrote a poem called To Forgive is to Remember. Let's listen to what the poet has to say about forgiveness and remembering. To forgive is to remember that nobody is perfect, that each of us stumbles when we want so much to stay upright, that each of us says things that we wish we had never said, that we can all forget that love is more important than being right. To forgive is to remember that we are so much more than our mistakes, that we are often more kind and caring, and that accepting another's flaws can help us accept our own. To forgive is to remember that the odds are pretty good that we might soon need to be forgiven ourselves. And that life sometimes gives us more than we can handle gracefully. To forgive is to remember that we do have room in our hearts to begin again and again in love. This is the kind of remembering that I'm talking about. A remembering that allows us to take into consideration our shared humanity. To remember that we're all imperfect and in need of forgiveness. You know, this week our, our Jewish siblings celebrated Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. And for Jews, of course, Yom Kippur is a time of getting back into right relationship with oneself and with others and with God. It's often a time of seeking forgiveness and, and reconciliation. Back when I was the minister of All Souls Church in Washington, D.C., on the Sunday closest to Yom Kippur, we'd always recite together a litany of atonement that is printed in the back of our, of our UU hymnal. The refrain of the litany is really simple, but also really powerful. It goes, we forgive ourselves and each other, and we begin again in love. And this morning, I'd like us to, to share this litany together. And as we, as we recite it together, as we repeat that refrain, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love, I want to invite us to imagine in our mind's eye someone that we might need to forgive. Or imagine someone whom we are in need of forgiveness from. And just hold them in our hearts as we share this reading. And even if we're not ready to forgive, as we share this litany today, maybe we can consider it like that prayer before the prayer of forgiveness and consider it a statement of our intent. So just say with me once more for practice before we begin. It goes, we forgive ourselves and each other We begin again in love. Okay. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others, 
we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For the selfishness which sometimes sets us apart and alone, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For losing sight of our unity, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For these and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. Amen. Friends, why don't we continue to hold this loving and gracious and forgiving intention in our hearts as we join together in singing our closing hymn it's number 323. I'm going to ask Linda to play it through once because it may be 